What's going on, everybody? Welcome to EBC Sports International. I'm your host, Ken Cruz, and thanks for being with us on another exciting episode. Before anything else, as always, let's see who's on our panel for today. First, from Toronto, Canada, we have Adrian Fangalina. Hey, what's up, Ken? Not as many Canadians this week, but I'll represent for one more. Yeah, Toronto stand up for, uh, they beat, um, who they beat tonight? The Knicks. The Knicks, the Knicks. Thanks to Scotty Barnes, the Rook. Uh, next, uh, from Las Vegas, Nevada, we have Brian Sonson. What's going on, Ken? Happy to be here. It's a beautiful Friday night. Let's keep talking up in sports. Yep, beautiful Friday night. Lakers won. It's a great day. Uh, and finally, from Santa Rosa Laguna, Philippines, Ben Bernaldez. What's up, Ken? And uh, I'm glad to be back at the show. It's exciting to have more uh, sports topics to discuss today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll get back to your spot sports topics over in the Philippines in a little second. And more importantly, we're here with you, our audience, watching from all over the world. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, a group of friends who love talking about sports. Before we get into our discussions today, let's start off with some news updates from the sports world. First off, our very own Joltis Horvath is with Anthony Sevilla uh, with some updates on the British Columbia High School Football Championships. Here's the report. The 2021 Subway Bowl of the BC High School Football Championships made its return to BC Play Stadium after being cancelled in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This year's event also faced tons of uncertainty because of the extreme flooding and landslides in southern BC, ultimately affecting the entire province of British Columbia. But despite all that, high school football is back home to BC Place. I'm Anthony Sevilla, and here with me is fellow EBC correspondent Jolti Horvath. Now, Jolti, uh, what was so different about this year's championships and what were the changes to this year's format? Yeah, so normally uh, they would have the best teams from around the province playing in quarterfinals, semifinals, and then the finals here at BC Place. However, because of the landslides and the flooding um, that affected British Columbia, basically the lower mainland, so the Vancouver area and Vancouver Island, is completely cut off from the rest of Canada. So BC School Sports had to do something a little bit different. Basically, they made a coastal championship and an interior championship. So what we witnessed here tonight was the coastal championship. Uh, Kelowna actually beat Vernon in the interior championship last night, 21 to 20. Okay, now let's jump to senior varsity, where we got a thriller overtime matchup for the 2A or AA coastal championship. The Carson Graham Eagles out of North Vancouver defeated the Robert Bateman Timberwolves out of Abbotsford, 40 to 38. So, Ajolti, what gave Carson the upper hand in this match? Uh, for me, it was definitely the quarterback, uh, Logan Mellish. Um, he's not your typical quarterback. He is tall, but he's big. He's more of a running back that can throw the ball. Um, he was heaving it downfield to Griffin Withers. Uh, that's uh, a wide receiver for the, for the Eagles, the Carson Graham Eagles. And those two were connecting all night. Now, both of these teams, Carson Graham and Robert Bateman, run air raid offenses, which means they pass most of the time. However, Bateman's defensive backs were keeping Carson Graham in check through the air. So Logan Mellish had to take it on his own and run the ball. I'm, I, he ran for over 100 yards tonight and two touchdowns. So he was definitely the X factor for me tonight. Now let's go to the final match of the day, which was for the AAA Senior Varsity Coastal Championship between the Terry Fox Ravens and the GW Graham Grizzlies out of Chilliwack. The Grizzlies took the lead heading into the second half and never looked back. Terry Fox had the momentum for the comeback, but Graham held on for the 36-33 win for the AAA Coastal Championship. So, uh, Jolti, what was special about this year's GW Graham team? Well, okay, so we just talked about all the flooding and the landslides in British Columbia. Now, GW Graham is located in Chilliwack, right? There are two highways that lead from Chilliwack to the lower mainland of British Columbia, the Vancouver area. Highway 1 has been closed for the last two weeks because of flooding. And Highway 7 is for essential travel only for truckers to deliver supplies into the interior and to the lower mainland. Now, GW Graham didn't know until last night that they would be able to make it to this game today. So 
I would say that they have had, over the last three weeks at least, they have had to face some of the most adversity in this entire league. Well, Terry Fox star running back Gavin Whittingham suffered an early match injury, which put him out for the rest of the game. How big of a blow was that for Terry Fox's offense? Oh, absolutely terrible blow. So Gavin Whittingham was a AAA all-star at running back, and he broke his collarbone on the second play of the game. However, for t even though Terry Fox lost, there's a lot to look forward to with these Terry Fox Ravens. Their quarterback is one of the best quarterbacks, not only in the province, but I would say one of the best high school quarterbacks in the country. And he's only a grade 11, so he's coming back next year. They had Zion Fleury, who's also a grade 11, step in for him. Even though it was a huge blow, there is a lot to look forward to in these Terry Fox Ravens next year. So we saw a lot of talent here today, these past few weeks. What can we look forward to in terms of BC high school football talent and the high school season and even the college season next, next year? Yeah, I mean, there, so we just talked about a bunch of grade 11s. There are more all-star grade 11s on these other teams that we saw tonight. For instance, GW Graham's uh, Vincent Braunauer, he's a grade 11. He's 6'1", 240 pounds. This kid had four sacks on his own tonight on Terry Fox. And we just talked about how Terry Fox's quarterback is one of the best quarterbacks in the country, and he's only a grade 11. So, I mean, you have that to look forward to. You're also getting a lot of these all-stars going on to college. I mean, how many college coaches were here compared to, you know, two years ago when we were here and, and even before that? There are two, three times the number of college coaches here in the building than there were previously. From our annual Subway Bowl coverage here at BC Place in Vancouver, I'm Anthony Sevilla and Jolti Orvath, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Thanks, Anthony and Jolti. We really appreciate the great analysis. Stay safe out there. Now, Adian has some updates from the world of racing. What do you have for us, Adian? Yes, thanks, Ken. Uh, it all comes down to the final race at the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, and there is so much on the line. Max Verstappen of Red Bull Racing and Lewis Hamilton of Mercedes enter Sunday's race atop of the standings for the World Championship with 369 and a half points apiece. That marks the first time since 1974 that two drivers entered the final race of the season tied for the first in the standings. And to make matters even more interesting, Verstappen is vying for his first World Championship while Hamilton aims for his eighth plus fifth in a row, which would be unprecedented. Also on the line is the Constructors' Championship in which Mercedes holds a 28-point advantage over Red Bull Racing. So needless to say, there is a lot at stake for the two teams. <clears throat> if that isn't enough, Lewis Hamilton pulled out the victory in the last race at the Saudi Arabia Grand Prix, which was complete chaos from beginning to end. The two drivers had collided on two separate occasions, yet they both managed to complete the race. This wasn't the first time they had collided this season either, as we saw them both retire earlier in Monza. It's only a few more days until we find out who stands atop this season's Drivers' Championship. Ken, back to you. Thanks, Aiden. Really appreciate it, sir. Let's go to Ben for the latest in Philippine sports. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Filipino boxer John Riel Casimir is out of his uh, mandatory WBO bantamweight title defense against uh, his uh, opponent, Paul Butler, in uh, the Probellum Revolution card uh, this uh, Saturday. Uh, Casimir's name had already been stricken off the promotional materials for the fight as seen during the weigh-in. Replacing him in the main event is Joseph Agbeko of Ghana. Uh, in a statement, uh, Probellum said, the Filipino boxer had to pull out of the bout after being unable to make it to the way in. The promotion also wished him a speedy recovery. Uh, reports said that Casimero was taken to the hospital uh, in a Facebook post. Casimero Scottman Stephen Luna said the Filipino is suffering from a viral gastritis. And uh, Casimero, who beat uh, Guillermo Rigondo via split decision in August to retain his title, was seen attending the public workout hosted by uh, Pro Bellum at the City Walk Dubai on Thursday. Uh, reports also suggested that Casimiro has been stripped of his title, but WBO has yet to make any uh, official announcement, and Butler uh, fight would be in Casimiro's third defense of his title. 
other Filipino fights in the Pro Bellum uh, card are Don Nietes and Jason Mama. Uh, in other story, EJ Obiena's legendary Paul Volt coach uh, Vitaly Petrov not only clarified that he was paid his uh, dues, but also cleared any misunderstanding that he uh, was, it was him who approached the Philippine Athletics Track and Field Association regarding his stipend. Uh, Petrov delivered a strong rebuke of the allegations against Obiena, saying he never approached Patafa, uh, which is the governing body for the athletics, regarding his pay, nor did he complain about his athlete regarding the issue of money. Uh, the Ukrainian coach added that the Patafa president, Philip Elayuiko, directly approached him and heavily questioned him along with former poll voter Sergei Bobka at uh, that pressured him into giving answers and uh, with the sporting official would like to hear. Uh, he mentioned, I have never proactively complained to anyone on EJ and payments, especially uh, specifically never to Patapa or any other Philippine sports official, wrote uh, Petro. Uh, what happened is, he said, uh, he had been directly approached by uh, Philip Wico and heavily questioned alongside by former athlete Sergey Bobka in a manner which confused him and felt pressured to answer in a way that uh, they wanted me, uh, they wanted him to answer. So Petrov added that he thought the questionnaire was going to be used to help create uh, a smoother payment process, but was instead, uh, as he wrote, used as a weapon to destroy uh, the promising uh, career of EJ Obiena. Uh, the Patapa back in November ordered Obiena to return 85,000 euros roughly 4.8 million pesos for alleged falsification of documents and failing to pay uh, Petrov. Uh, Petrov also stressed that Obiena did pay him, even exceeding the 85,000 euros that he was owed and said it was because of Patapa's inefficiency that he is uh, that his stipend was sometimes late. Back to you, Ken. Thanks so much, Ben. Really appreciate those updates for Philippine sports. Lastly, Brian has some news on the Olympics to be held in Beijing and how some countries are announcing a diplomatic boycott of the Games. Brian. Thanks, Ken. The initial functions for the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics are right around the corner, and some U.S. authorities will not be making an appearance. President Joe Biden's organization said for the current week that it would not send U.S. government authorities to the Beijing Games in protest of China's basic freedoms infringement, remembering its maltreatments against the Uyghurs for Xinjiang and hostile to vote based crackdown in Hong Kong. The United Kingdom, Australia and Canada likewise said for the current week that they will keep their designations at home. This political blacklist is uh, definitely not um, an all out protest or dissent of the Games and will not keep competitors from participating in the 2022 Olympics. However, Olympic blacklists can be precarious things. The last time the U.S. attempted it was during the 1980 Moscow Olympics to fight the Soviet Union's Afghanistan intrusion. A few backers are saying that discussing any sort of blacklist in association with the Olympic Games might raise awareness of China's um, atrocities. It might likewise come down on sports bodies for this situation the international olympic committee to re-examine later on back to you ken awesome story brian really appreciate it and that's it for this week's sports news after the break we'll dive right into our topics starting with the most recent nba power rankings we'll be right back Ang paggawa ng pelikula ay isang kamanghamanghang pagkakataon para sa mga mahilig manood ng sine o ang tawag ng iba ay pinilakang tabing. But as they say, it is another thing to create a filmmaking business that makes money. Para kumita ang pelikula, you need to know about sales, distribution, the audience, and how to get your film out there. Katulad ng ibang negosyo, pinaplano ang konsepto ng screenplay, ang gusto ng manonood, sino ang cast and crew para sa isang magandang pelikula, lalo na ang director nito. At pakikipag-partner sa mga sales agents at distributors, maging ang uri 
tema o tipo ng pelikula. What can a person expect before embarking on the business of filmmaking or production? In this episode, we'll find out the tricks of the trade with our guest, the CEO of Kai's Ventures, direct Eric Kizon, as we discuss directing and filmmaking as a business. Kung mga pelikula mo, gusto mong makarating sa mga international platforms. Ang pinaka-importante sa, sa mga to, kailangan maganda ang sound, kailangan maganda ang, uh, ang quality. Before I criticize a movie, I try to enjoy it first. All these in this episode of Open for Business. Tulong para sa kabuhayan ng mga katutubong ITAS, inihatid ng Responde. Pagsagip sa mga batang rugby sa Santa Rosa, Laguna, ikinasa. Mga batang isinilang na may club foot, bibigyan ng pag-asa na makapaglakad ng diretsyo. Sabado, alas 6 hanggang alas 7 ng gabi. Ito ang responde, mata ng mamamayan. Welcome back, sports fans. This is EBC Sports International. The latest NBA rankings have just been released, and to many, it's no surprise which team tops this list. First, let's go do a quick countdown of the top fives. So number five, we have the Utah Jazz, not surprising. Number four, the surprising one of the season, the Chicago Bulls. Well, I don't know if it's surprising. We'll talk about that in a second. Number three, the Milwaukee Bucks, and number two, Phoenix Suns, and of course, number one, the streaking Golden State Warriors. Now let's ask the panel, do you agree with this ranking? Let's start off with Brian. All right, Ken. So let's break down this breakdown real quick. It's hard to argue that the Warriors should not be in the number one spot for most lists in the regular season. Uh, when you look at their team, when you look at how they play, they look poised for another championship run after just two seasons, two down years um, due to injuries. Now, the Phoenix Suns at number two, um, in my opinion, they are the clear-cut number two in the league after Golden State. I don't think there's any argument there. Um, Chris Paul is Chris Paul. I mean, Mikhail Bridges is locking up players, including Steph Curry. Um, DeAndre Ayton is just improving as a player, a team player, and a defender. Um, those rankings that, those rankings I, I don't, I mean, I, I can't argue with those. The ones that I do argue with, however, are the Utah Jazz all the way down to number five. Um, that one's a little bit confusing to me. I mean, I can see where they're coming from. Yes, you know, the Bulls are on the rise as a contender in the East, maybe a championship contender in the future. But I wouldn't say that they're better than the Jazz are right now because they have won six straight games um, and Really, no one's really talking about them, and I think it's because you know they're, you know, kind of a smaller, a smaller team, um, smaller market uh, team in the league. Um, outside of Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert, none of the players really stick out as a you know a marketable team. Um, but I mean, they just they just keep on coming in, in and out of games, winning them, and like for example, I mean, look at Rudy Gobert. Um, people are just kind of bagging on him for some reason. But, I mean, he, he kind of, you know, shuts them out by responding to, to them um, in, his, in, in his play, not by talking to them, not by talking trash to them. And he just did that last night, too, by putting up, uh, I think, a double-double, 17 points, 21 rebounds, something like that. So I really honestly don't think the Jazz get enough respect, and I think that shows with, with a ranking like this. Yeah, uh, Pat Bev talking uh, smack about Rudy Gobert is the funniest thing I've heard all week. Um, you know, it's just a really strange thing. I mean, there's levels to this, right? Uh, there's a reason why uh, Rudy, Go Rudy Gobert gets paid what he gets paid and Pat Bev gets paid what he gets paid. Um, but, I mean, other than that, I mean, Adian, like, the 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 Warriors are are streaking, yet they still don't have Clay Thompson or James Wiseman. Those guys are set to be back, supposedly, sometime this season. Clay a little sooner than James, but... I mean, do you think they're going to keep 
this number one spot, especially with Steph Curry only 10 three pointers away from number one all time three point uh, ma three points made in the NBA. Adrian, uh, I think you're on uh, you're on mute, sir. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Yeah. No worries. No worries. I, what Go I ahead. said. What I said is uh, what Steph Curry is doing is unbelievable. The way he's performing on a day-to-day -day basis is is just, it makes you uh, just really pull out your hair if you're an opposing team, but also if you're a Golden State Warriors fan or even a Steph Curry fan, uh, you're just left in amazement. Um, yeah, I, the Golden State Warriors, I said this about uh, last week, I do feel like they're built for a title this year, um, but it's going to take time, I think, for Klay Thompson to gel, for James Wiseman to gel. Um, and I do think as deep as they are, they don't have as much experience, relatively speaking. Like we, we, we know Clay, Draymond Green, Steph Curry. Those are the three anchor pieces. And maybe you throw in Kevon Looney there as the guys who've been there for a long time. But uh, guys like Andrew Wiggins, Jordan Poole, uh, you throw in some of the rookies that might be contributing. Even uh, Bielitsa, uh, another guy, Otto Porter Jr., those guys yep. have only been with the team for a little less than two seasons. Um, maybe Andrew uh, Wiggins months. is that guy months. to kind of like, yeah, to, to, to really to glue things together. Um, but to rely on Andrew Wiggins is like, <laughs> it's it's not a very reliable thing to do to rely on uh, Andrew Wiggins. I couldn't think of a great analogy. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, uh, I'll repeat what I said last week. The Phoenix Suns, I feel, are more built for regular season success just because of, of how they've won um, in the past and how, how much success they've had in uh, the past postseason. I think that because I just feel like everybody knows their role on that team. Uh, they're very solid from top to bottom. They're well coached. I feel like they could sustain injuries as we've seen with Devin Booker being out right now. Um, they play solid defense. Mikel Bridges is probably going to be defensive player of the year this year. Um, and DeAndre Ayton has missed tons of games, yet they still keep rattling off wins. Now, if that were the case with the Warriors, if they were to lose either Steph Curry or uh, Draymond Green, I feel like they could take a slide, um, and maybe that might reflect in the regular season record. I just think that Phoenix, at the end of the season, will have a better record, but what I will say is Golden State is more built for playoff success. That's all I really got to say about that. Well, uh, great, great points, Andy. And I mean, especially I think the the biggest Achilles heel for Phoenix, uh, for Phoenix specifically, is CP3 in the playoffs. I mean, he's proven time and time again that he can't stay healthy at the last stretch, and that has really affected a lot of his uh, playoff potential. Whether it would be with the Clippers, the Rockets, and even the Suns last year, he was always hurt when they need him the most, and that is very um, disappointing. I mean, but I mean, what can you do, right? I mean, especially now that he's a lot older, he's one of the old, uh, you know, oldest players in the league, especially for his team, um, with at such a vital position. Now let's go to Ben. Ben, I have a um, number six that's on this list that uh, I didn't mention earlier is the the Brooklyn Nets. Um, you know, obviously there's a, a solid chance that Kyrie Irving won't play the entire season. And that's looking more like a reality than it is than it isn't. Uh, uh, so, I mean, what are your thoughts on the Nets without Kyrie, still with a struggling James Harden, but you know, KD is still putting in work. Uh, I mean, what what are your thoughts on them being number six and them potentially still being the you know the top um, team in the East? Uh, I'm surprised that they're only in the top six. Uh, I would uh, uh, put him on top five other than the Utah Jazz. Uh, it's, the Nets are still a pretty strong team without Kyrie. Uh, of course, with uh, let's not count out uh, KD uh, in, in the situation. I think uh, he is still able to uh, carry the team even with uh, James Harden struggling. And we can see how uh, KD it has... A, MVP caliber, and he is able to uh, change the the momentum of the team despite the, those uh, so many issues that happening uh, with the team. And uh, I think uh, in, in the next coming week, uh, probably the, the rankings will definitely improve. And I, I don't see Kyrie 
uh, really playing for the Nets and the Nets better trade him as fast uh, as soon as possible so that they can focus on uh, winning uh, because of the situation I uh, really don't know what's happening with Kyrie so that's it's better just to let let him go and just focus on what what they have right now uh, definitely they are still a strong contender uh, I would put uh, the Nets on top five rather than the Utah Jazz but still the number one number two uh, the the Warriors and the Suns are playing great basketball and my bold prediction would be definitely the, the Warriors going all the way to the finals and let's see who's going to be the, going to be the uh their opponent on the final set. Actually, so that's, that's not that that's surprising. my bold prediction well i mean yeah. that's not that bold of a prediction but what is your bold prediction for the eastern conference finalist uh for the eastern conference finals um uh i think that's the we'll probably have to choose with uh with either uh I would definitely choose with the uh, with with Suns going uh, the second and with the box. They want to have to have to really have to defend their title. So either of those two. All right, Warriors, Warriors and Bucks. It is. I mean, no, uh, Adian or Brian. Are any of you guys going to take the Bulls going to the finals this year? <laughs> no, no, too young, <laughs> uh, too inexperienced, and they're not ready. They no. can't beat the Bucks. They can't beat the Nets. No. <laughs> uh, Brian. Who's gonna stop Giannis? I mean, who's gonna Great stop Giannis? Point. Who's gonna stop KD? They need I to have that kind of a stopper in order for them to get right. past. Who's gonna stop them beat even? Well, that and the only champion, not the only, but the main championship experience you have on the team is Alex Caruso. That's great, but that's not <laughs> enough. Um, hey guys, it, it, can I ask one quick question? Is there any word on the plant-based vaccine? Because if I heard if Kyrie Irving will take that. So if that's the case, he may return. <laughs> Nothing I've heard from the FDA on that, but I mean, uh, <laughs> let's not rule out something crazy uh, that might change. I mean, this has been a crazy season already. Um, not inc- I mean, We haven't even talked about Ben Simmons, but it's a crazy season where a lot of the stars are just all over the place. But uh, speaking of stars, oh my goodness, let's talk about the second NBA topic. So, the New Orleans Pelicans, also in the waiting game uh, when it comes to getting their star on the court. Zion Williamson, obviously the team's like superstar top draft pick from a couple years ago. We've all seen these pictures. Um, we've seen him warming up, doing the 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 side uh, the sideline uh, liners, uh, extremely slow uh, a couple months ago. And uh, recently, there's been accusations that he has blown up to 330 pounds, or for those um, in kilograms, uh, 149 kilos. Let's ask our panel, what are your thoughts about Zion now and his future? Let's go with Ben. Uh, for for short term, uh, if he comes back, uh, definitely he can make an impact. But if he is uh, fully healthy and he has been, the weight problem has been his issue ever since uh, he was drafted uh, during 2019. Even he played with the uh, Duke University, and that has been his issue with his weight, uh, and because of that, more injuries since he came to the league and there have been some good and great NBA players in the past who have had their careers shortened uh, for the same reason. Uh, I wonder if Zion will be one of them, uh, a one and done uh, player, uh, if he doesn't really do something about his body. And with the progression of all the young players in the league, I think it's nearly impossible for Zion to be, you know, the face of uh, the Pelicans uh, with his classmate like Yamarant, uh, I definitely, uh, she, uh, he who had been the number one pick rather than uh, Zion during the 2019 draft. And I don't think it will change if he doesn't make a change uh, with his body. And he needs to have a personal dietitian, a trainer to really work on his weight. You know, 
it's if he doesn't do that, I think it's going to be too late for him. Yeah, I mean, uh, speaking of which, um, you know, so supposedly his dietitian, nutritionist, uh, before getting, uh, I think he got, he just got one recently, but before that was his mother. And I, I can only imagine what kind of food she was, <laughs> I mean, he, mom's that, cooking. that and he's he's in New Orleans, right? So they have the best gumbo in the, in the, in the earth. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Adian, uh, you have the misfortune of drafting uh, Zion onto your fantasy you had to, team. You had and, to bring that up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I need to get to, I need to get your thoughts, sir. I mean, like, uh, what, like, what are you like? We saw a picture of him that looked like he was maybe 270, 280, but then there's also a picture of him in sweats where he looks like he is 330. Like, what is the truth here? And I, I kind of have to uh, filter my thoughts for you, uh, and, and I'll do my best here. <laughs> but from the very beginning of his career, there were red flags. Uh, uh, I don't want to go that far back, but looking at the beginning of this offseason, he had knee surgery. David Griffin and the Pelicans and all of the executives kept that under wraps. They didn't let anybody know he had surgery until the media press conference on uh, media day. Uh, so that means he did not work on his game all offseason, Meaning, when he was cleared for five-on-five five activities only weeks ago, that was pretty much the first time he's played basketball since last regular season. And then we find out five days after that, he tweaks his foot, and it's nothing to be—it's nothing serious. But I mean, he's already missed more games than he's played. I saw a stat: he's missed 86 games, and he's only appeared in 85. That is that. That, that, there's tons of red flags. Also, like you said, it doesn't help that he's in New Orleans. It doesn't help that his mom is his dietitian. Uh, it, there's a lot to be concerned about. I, I, there's tons of red flags. Will he be an all-time great? I, I, not not the way it's progressing right now. And uh, New Orleans just seems like they have this curse going on. Uh, it's it's tough. <laughs> I, I, um, it's 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 very unfortunate. Brian, before the break, let's get your quick thoughts. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say. I mean. Like what Adian said, it, it's been months since he stepped out on the court. I mean, some some New Orleans uh, sports fans are joking that he's playing the wrong sport and he should play for the <laughs> Saints because they could use some help. <laughs> and to put it simply, honestly, he, he could really only make a positive impact because right now he's going to make a negative impact on the court immediately just from the way he moves, just how slow and out of shape he's going to be. And, you know, especially with his knock knees, I mean, I'm hoping that we don't see the end of his career because he has so much potential, so much potential. He has all the physical tools in the world, but I really don't, I really hope it doesn't end, you know, from an unhealthy diet. That would be the worst way to end his career. Agreed, agreed. And it's tough. He looks like Sean Kemp at the end of his, end of, end of his career. And even when he was in Duke, he was waddling like a penguin. So, I mean, like, it, the signs were there. As you guys mentioned, the flags yep. were there. But, I mean, he is an all-time generational talent. And for that, um, you know, we only wish the best for him. Hopefully, he can recover. Thanks for the takes, everybody. We're going to talk NFL right after the break. Don't go anywhere. EBC Sports International. We'll return in a moment.
Welcome back, everyone. This is EBC Sports International. I'm your host, Ken Cruz, here in Washington, D.C. For this next topic, we'd like to send a greeting to my, our very own Mike Hudson, my dear friend over in Seattle, Washington, because now we're going to talk about his beloved Seattle Seahawks, specifically Russell Wilson. Now, rumors are out there of a potential move to another NFL team three teams that are being mentioned so just fyi he has a no trade clause that he can take off at any point and supposedly supposedly those three teams that he would take up take out his no trade clause for are the new york giants denver broncos and the new orleans saints now just yesterday wilson did say that he has no plans on leaving seattle and basically called the rumors a quote unquote non-story now how true is that? I don't know. I mean, well, uh, the, uh, we've heard some stranger things. We do know that their head coach is on the hot seat, and this is a very tough season for them record-wise and play-wise. In any case, just for the sake of discussion, let's ask some questions. First question, should Wilson take the trade? And two, if he does, where should he go? Let's start off with Adian. Uh it seemed like there were rumors, uh, even in the offseason, right? Uh, there mm -hmm. were four teams that he was being targeted to. And now, with this whole list of three teams, the only team that remains is the New Orleans Saints. Uh, I think he's an interesting fit in all three of those teams, and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, on the Broncos, that might actually be nice because he's got a lot of talent on the offense, and they're pretty loaded on defense aside from Correct. trading their best player away just now. Uh, but that actually means they have a little more draft capital uh, moving forward. With the Giants, a similar situation to the Seahawks. Uh, they got a lot of talent, but all they really need is a QB, so Russell Wilson could step right in and, and, and fill that, that role. Um, but I think the best fit will be with the New Orleans Saints, just because of the amount of success they've had over the past few years. Um, it seems to me like he would be a great successor to Drew Brees. Uh, James Winston, obviously, he had a, 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 the tragic injury earlier this season. Um, I feel like Russell Wilson will be all that James Winston is and way more, uh, potentially an MVP candidate again, if uh, assuming he can get healthy as uh, quickly as possible. But yeah, I, I do like that fit in New Orleans the best. Good, 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 uh, good analysis there. Now, Brian, uh, Russell, Russell's 33. Um, he's not a young guy, but I mean, so Tom Brady's 44, right? So, I mean, we're talking, but at the same time, Russell Wilson's a mobile quarterback. Yes, he can throw, and yes, he does have good accuracy, but I mean, his numbers haven't been stellar uh, coming back from the injury. I mean, what do you think? Does he have enough uh, left in the tank, and what are your choices? Uh, what's your choice for best team should he accept the trade? Uh, should he take out his trade clause? Honestly, I feel like Russ is still fighting. He's still recovering from his injury, and he's still trying to get back into the, the groove of um, playing with the Seahawks, which might be why he's not playing as as good as he normally does. I mean, last, last season, he was already having an MVP caliber season. Um, he, we were just one year removed from that. Um, but right now, I feel like it's, he... He just can't really play up to his level right now, especially with the record that they have, with the personnel that they have. I feel like they need to make some big moves. So it's really up to the front office. It's it's the pressure is on them, in my opinion, for them to to start making some some changes, um, po possibly to their O line, so that Russell doesn't have to just scramble every play um, and, and you know risk him uh, getting injured again and losing his legs in the process, or um, putting some changes into the defense as well, because I mean, their defense is one of the worst in the league. You know, we're about, I don't know, five or six years removed from the Legion of boom. Um, we need to, you know, move on from that and finally make some moves on that end. Um, but honestly, if, if he were to choose a team and um, activate his no trade clause, I agree with Adia. I mean, uh, out of those three teams, that's the obvious choice. Uh, the New Orleans saints, um, they're the most established team. Uh, they have, everything on paper that Russell Wilson needs that the Seahawks currently don't um, outside of um, the offense that the Saints have um, because the Seahawks, they at least have a wide receiver duo. Um, the Saints have, you know, an O-line. 
they have a very good defense. Um, they have a good running core. So if they have all of that, I mean, already established, you know, why wait a couple of years or potentially never with the Seahawks um, staying on and stay on that team when you could just maybe um, come up with a decision to move on, um, you know, start the next chapter of your career and maybe get another ring with the Saints. So, I mean, there's a lot to think about with Russ. Agreed. I mean, I, I also agree that he does have a lot left in the tank when healthy. Now, Ben, what are your thoughts on this? Should we let Russ cook somewhere else, or should he stay as a Seattle Seahawk? Uh, there's been reports and rumors that uh, he wants to stay with the Seahawks, but it's not uh, showing that uh, with his performance. And if he's not happy with the team, then he 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 may be uh, traded. And if he wants to do that, then uh, the team should let him. But I think this is... Uh, a very surprising, I think for me, uh, aside from the Giants, the, the, the Broncos and other teams, that uh, uh, there's also another team that would be best fit for him. The Washington football team, I think would oh. be best for him. Wow. Uh, for me personally, uh, with the founda foundational pieces on both sides of the ball and defense uh, built to win now, I think he's a better fit for, for that team. And uh, trading for a uh, proven commodity should be the first course of direction to address the QB position in 2022 for the Washington, for the Washington team. But yes, Wilson is 33 years old. Uh, he's not yet peaking. I think he uh, he's not yet done. He's getting better with age. Uh, over the last five seasons, he amassed 52-27-1 uh, record uh, while completing 65.3% of his passes for the 249.6 uh, yards per game and 161 touchdowns. So the most in the league during that stretch and uh, just 47 interceptions. So I think he still has a lot of, uh, you know, stuff to prove. And uh, I think he can still be a better uh, player as well for another team. And for the Washington fans, I think uh, he is the best fit for their team. If it does happen, and they, they need to pursue him if they want him. And I think um, for, for his position right now and uh, with what is going on. I think a better environment would be uh, better for him, for him to have uh, another more years, uh, productive years uh, in his career. Great point, sir. Great point, uh, fellas. I mean, those were um, great, great suggestions. I mean, uh, I'll, uh, EJ, if you're watching this, uh, uh, make that bid for Russell Wilson. I think he would improve your team, agreed. Now let's talk more NFL by looking at the upcoming matchups. There are some matchups that have a long history between rival teams and some that have some playoff implications. Let's start off with this week, Cardinals versus Rams Monday night football. Adian, thoughts on this matchup? Oh, big time matchup, big time matchup. I know you've got a lot invested being a Rams fan. Yes, I do. And uh, since they've acquired two big names, they haven't been playing up to standard, uh, but they did pick up a W last week. Same with the Cardinals. Uh, if I have to make a prediction, I, I do feel like the Rams are going to win this one. Uh, I'll tell you why. The Cardinals are 3-2 and two at home. They haven't been playing their greatest football. They're 7-0 and oh on the road. Uh, but for whatever reason at home, they can't get it cooking. And I do think the Rams, because they had lost earlier in the season, they'll avenge this loss. So uh, if, if, I'm, if you're asking me to predict it, I, I got Rams winning this one 31-27. My heart is with you, Adian. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Raiders versus Chiefs. Brian, I, I obviously got to give this one to you. Man, Ken, the Raiders. The Raiders. They're going through their traditional midseason slump right now. And uh, <laughs> they're at 6-6, six and six, as predicted. Honestly, uh, things aren't looking too good for Vegas. The, the rest of their schedule looks absolutely brutal. And with a weak defense like the one that they have right now in a middle-of-the-pack offense, it's kind of it won't be hard to admit that they'll lose this game and possibly even miss the playoffs as much as i hate to say i mean i i i believe the chiefs are are on their way to you know another super bowl super bowl run they are proving again that they are the team to beat in the afc i mean they're back their defense is no longer the worst of all time you know chris jones is finally back and um honestly i feel like this is going to be an easy win for the chiefs especially at home it's going to be 31 to 20. 
Do you think, uh, real quick, do you think Patrick Mahomes, is, his mental game is back on track? I think so. I think so, yeah. I feel like he was he was um, kind of beside himself in a way that he was second-guessing his, his throws. Yep. And also, like, his, his throws that usually turn into, and like a 100% completion to either Tyreek or Kelsey or what, whoever receiver, it it's just like off by like an inch or a, a millisecond or it gets dropped. So I feel like he's finally back in that groove and I'm, I'm happy to see it. I'm happy to see this this chaos that is Patrick Mahomes. The league is better when Mahomes is cooking. Uh, last game of the week, Ben, Bills versus Buccaneers, your Buccaneers. That's right, Ken. Uh, this is a, a, a preview of what could be a uh, another Super Bowl matchup. You know, Whoa! Buccaneers and the Bills. It's, you know, uh, the the Bucks are unbeaten at home, and now uh, Tom Brady or visit an old rival. Uh, the Bills rank second in NFL in scoring defense, and they pose an interesting challenge. And uh, Tom Brady and the Buccaneers will exploit any potential weaknesses in the secondary, and they may have to. And with success of Buffalo's run defense, uh, if the Bills can make this uh, a low-scoring game, uh, this should be a uh, a great matchup and uh, more more than capable of uh, uh, of a great uh, TV uh, for this matchup. I think uh, it's a close game. It's going to be 30-24. Uh, great takes, guys. Appreciate it. We have more Brady after the break, so stay with us. We'll be right back. Ready na ba kayo sa mga tanong namin na nakakaaliw at nakakabaliw? Let's take a look at our Dollar Gamers for tonight. Mike Cabasco, a.k.a. Ma Willie Taylor! Herman Santos, a.k.a. Apple D.A. Christopher Samson, a.k.a. Kuko Martin! Michael Angelo Alasak, a.k.a. Mr. B. Paul! Sino ang nakasama ni Mel Gibson sa isang Oscar-winning movie na The Year of Living Dangerously? Mr. B. Dunn! Uh... <laughs> B. Start again? Start again! saya, tawanan at iba't ibang pakulo sa inyong umaga. Busog pa kayo sa kaalaman Tony Knows at updated sa umaarangkadang mga balita. Matutong kumita, magluto, mayroon din sayawan at kantahan. What? I am a good girl. Programa na nagbibigay inspirasyon sa bawat kada all over the world. Here in Net25, we are your fans. Everybody! Lunes hanggang biyernes, alas 6 hanggang alas 8 ng umaga. Dito lang sa Net25. At home kayo rito. Welcome back, everyone. This is EBC Sports International. I'm Ken Cruz from Washington, D.C. Hope everyone is staying safe out there. And stay, uh, thanks for staying with us throughout this program. Tom Brady has been the center of many conversations here on our show. And yes, once again, we'll be talking about him. Sports Illustrated just named him Sports Person of the Year. I want to know, at 44 years old, was this the right choice? Ben. I agree, Ken. Uh, uh, Tom Brady has come a long way and he has many talents and skills uh, that he has uh, proven us. Uh, his humbleness and praise for the people that helped him uh, become a legend sets him apart. And this dude also is all class and such a shining example for young athletes. 
I know uh, people are sick of him, but he's one of a kind, and we need to cherish that. And he is uh, the GOAT, uh, as uh, Gronk uh, mentioned during the presentation. And he deserved uh, the award for uh, for being the sports person of the year. Yeah, so other uh, potential athletes of the year were Giannis Antetokounmpo, Simone Biles, Suni Lee, uh, both uh, gymnastics participants for Team USA. Um, and then you have, oh, obviously, Shohei Otani, who had one of the best uh, seasons as a batter and pitcher for the um, LA Angels. Now, Brian, is this was was Tom Brady the right choice? I honestly think so. He had some tough competition, like the the athletes that you mentioned. But right now, with the season that he's having at his age, I mean, it's hard to argue against that. Even if it, this is going to be now his second time winning Sports Person of the Year, he won it all the way back in 2005 when he was in his 20s and he was supposedly in his prime. And now he's 44 and he's still in his prime, which is crazy to crazy. say. And, crazy. and it shows you like the, the lengths to which he will continue to just grind day in and day out just so he can get another, just so we can have another chance of getting another uh, Super Bowl championship. And he's still playing at an MVP level. It's it's unheard of, greatest QB ever, um, one of the greatest athletes of all time. And I would, I'm not mad at that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Aiden, uh, round us off. What are your, th what are your thoughts on uh, Tom Brady's sports person of the year by Sports Illustrated? Yeah, no argument there. He, it seemed like the right thing to do to cap off a uh, magical season uh, from going to Tampa making that decision, bringing Gronk with him, uh, and winning a Super Bowl in his first year outside of New England. Yes, sir. Uh, that is, that, that would have been like if Michael Jordan went to the Wizards and won in his first year. You know what I mean? Like, that doesn't happen. It, it'll be like if Tiger Woods comes back from injury and wins his first tour. Uh, that Like, it's just, it's unheard of. It's not going to happen ever again. And, and I think... Brady is not just now, he's not just chasing rings. He's chasing greatest athlete of all time, like ever. He's trying to chase the likes of like Muhammad Ali and 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 those greats I'm talking. Um, yeah, I, he definitely deserves this. It, it's a perfect way to cap off his career if, if or when he ever does retire. But uh, can I shout out Giannis? Because Giannis Antetokounmpo, who plays in the league, with LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, rose above all of that last year, rose above COVID and all the different protocols going on all of last season, and won that championship. I would say that's that was pretty pretty uh, impressive as well. With one leg. Yeah. I mean, crazy. <laughs> uh, honestly, like uh, I would not have been mad should Giannis have won this. Uh, he's had a stellar year himself. But, fellas, thanks for the takes on that. Let's finish up with the question of the week. So as many know, Lions finally won. The Detroit Lions finally won their first game of the season thanks to Jared Goff's uh, last-second touchdown pass, former Rams uh, uh, Jared Goff. Uh, which team from any league had the all-time worst season for you? I'll start. For me, it was the 2015-2016 uh, Lakers. Um Kobe's last year, actually, uh, they had their franchise worst year the year before, and then they had the franchise worst year that year, Kobe's last year, winning only 17 games, 65 losses, personal oh, worst shit. season for me. Now let's go to, let's stick with Adian. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that was a bad year. I can agree. Those Robert Sacre and... Uh, wolf, uh, Wolf. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell Bobby you another player on the team. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I personally, it, it's a recent one. I'm going to go with the 2016 Philadelphia 76ers, who finished with a record of 10 and 72. Yikes. Although they didn't make the record for the worst record ever, uh, they made a rule change. They changed it so that drafting um, the the draft order for the top three teams was not based on record. It was just all equal odds are you know i i, I, yep. I don't want to explain it but yeah if it you're so the, bad it, that you have to change the, the policy rules. correct there you mm -hmm. go there you go yeah that that is that is uh what's it called i forgot what the what was the 76ers um the process the process trust the process. Trust the process yep and it ended up working except they haven't won yet uh let's yeah. go to brian uh, i'm gonna 
turn uh, turn a different sport now onto the NFL with the 2017 0 and 16 Cleveland Browns. They Whoa. became the first franchise in NFL history to have multiple consecutive losing seasons. I mean, that is like all time worse, <laughs> like all time bad. Like they they had uh, another. They had I think 28 games. Um, following their previous um, season without a win. And that is another record. Like, these are the records you don't want to have. So I, I, I want to give it to them. 0-16 Cleveland Browns. Russell Wilson and this team's Browns would be actually very good. Uh, now let's finish off with Ben. Uh, I would go with 2011-2012 uh, Charlotte Bobcats. You know, 7-59 ah. record. I think it's the worst in <laughs> NBA you know, you remember uh, the Bobcats didn't have uh, much talent to begin with. No, after, you know, not after uh, owner Michael Jordan signed off on trade uh, of Tyson Chandler and Gerald, uh, Gerald Wallace in recent years. But injuries to Corey Maggetti and DJ Gossin left Charlotte's uh, uh, lineup uh, really in a bad uh, uh, position. Like the rookies, Kemba Walker and Bismarck Biombo, uh, they were really forced to do a major... Uh, roles and carry the team, but this was the really uh, the worst uh, record in the NBA in the 759, and also the worst record for Michael Jordan as well. Yeah, they're so bad they rebranded to the Hornets. Now, <laughs> thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks, thanks everyone. That's all the time that we have for this week's episode. On behalf of our panel, thank you so much for joining us, and be sure to tune in once again next week. Be sure to visit our websites at eaglenews.net and eaglenewslive.com. And watch us on net25.com. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Eagle News PH and join the conversation. For Eagle News, I'm Ken Cruz. We live in interesting times. <laughs>